It's Ports of Call Waterfront Dining, award-winning service and cuisine with a view of the dynamic L.A. Harbor from every seat. For reservations and directions, visit portsofcalldining.com or call 310-833-3553. Energize the Lawn Friend Podcast. It's November the 28th. It's after Thanksgiving. I don't do this very often, but when I do, it's always magical because I never know what I'm doing. Want to hear something funny? Ray Bradbury told me this that day I sat in his house when I was working on Tommy Lee's book proposal, and I said, the illustrated man would be kind of a good template. So I went to Ray's house. I put a note in his bar- in his in his big mailbox. I said, can we talk about this book? And sat with him and and and. He says, well, I was never into tattoos, but uh, I thought that storytelling from each illustration would be a good symbol. And I said, Phew. and I, then and then he said something to me. He goes, uh, let me, he goes, Lon, here, here's one thing you have to understand. Federico Fellini said this to me on, the mov- on a movie set. He said, if for one instance I ever look like I know what I'm doing, kick me. <laughs> So that pretty much, in a nutshell, is and energize the Lawn Friend podcast. I thought for sure that you that you were stuck, you couldn't show, but you know what? Intuitively, I know because you're a brother, you would get you would get here, Gregory D'Angelo. Hell or high water, man. Hell or high water. Yeah. He lives in like fifty miles. Thank you, brother. Oh, oh it's, it's thank you. So now we're gonna devote. Uh-oh. We're gonna devote the remainder of this show wow. to telling stories. And here's where I want to start. I showed you my shoes last night, right? I did. Okay. Very okay. handsome. Okay, so it's funny because, you know, I hadn't been to Wendy's house in a few years. And I lived in Long Beach for a while, at 2011, 2012. <clears throat> I was going to say, well, I, I drove by the bus stop. I got mugged on in 2012. But I'm not going to bring that up. I'm going to keep it light. It's just a bus stop. It's just a bus stop, and it was just a pipe to my side of my head. It's nothing. <laughs> anyway, PTSD, pff, small potatoes. So I, 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 I said to Greg, I go, look at my shoes. I got these back. They've been sitting in Wendy's closet for like four years. I, I don't even remember I had really? them. But but. These are Alice Cooper's shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I said, if you come to do the show with me tomorrow, I'll tell you the story about these shoes. In 2010, Alice Cooper and Bob Ezrin gave me a wonderful project to do. The liner notes to a UK box set called Alice Cooper Old School 1964 to 1974. And I wrote this yearbook, which is about 50 pages. And it, it was the inside of a desk. And Ernie, Ernie Cephalou, who designed the original School's Out cover with all the graffiti on it, designed this desk box. And it opened up and it had all this special DVD and B-sides and vinyls. Great package. So when the, I, I, I worked really hard on it. I interviewed the original band, with the exception of Michael Bruce, who's no longer with us. I mean... No, Michael Bruce, who, which is the one that Glenn Buxton is no longer with us. Michael Bruce is, is with us. Dennis Dunaway, they're with us. <clears throat> and I finish the project, and I get, I get this phone call. Lon, it's Bob. I'm with Alice. He's going through his closet. And then Coop gets on the phone. He goes, so I'm, I'm, I'm filling up a suitcase with shoes, pants, golf shoes, balls, clubs what oh i'm giving them to you i go really he goes yeah you're gonna get some some of my hand-me-downs i go okay thanks and like a week later this huge purple suitcase arrives via calico his daughter we meet at the rainbow she she sends me an email my dad sent you a suitcase full of stuff and i (laughs) went through the suitcase and there were alice's clothes (laughs) <laughs> pants and they fit me perfectly like we were the exact same size and i can and uh, you know i'm sorry to say liquidating throughout my life i it, i did put on ebay a couple pairs of his pants and i said this is just, these are alice cooper's pants and yeah. i know they bid up to like 50 or 60 dollars <laughs> <laughs> but that helped me eat that week 
there and is. help me pay for my daughter's school. She's yeah, going to yeah. expensive school back east in those years. So um, there are these white loafers, <laughs> and I wore them everywhere. They, they have these ribbed soles. They were so comfortable. It's like you didn't even feel them. And I didn't see him till last night when I crashed at Wendy's and we went to this benefit that Lanny Cordola put on for his peace children, and did his you wear Afghanistan them? children, which is, and I wore them and I saw a guy and Greg came to the studio last night and he goes, where are you? I think I'm in the right place. I go, it's tomorrow. So even more, <laughs> even more dedication to friendship is the fact that he drove all the way down here again. What but a, he, last night he went and saw some good bands. Yeah, right? what, a, what a drummer thing to do. <laughs> it's such a drummer <laughs> thing to do. Oh, anyway. So that's, so I had this, so I said, I'll tell you if you come tomorrow. And, and he came. Now, here's where our relationship starts. I go to a starting point. My first trip to Asia was in 1989, and White Lion had ju had released a very popular record, and Atlantic Records called, and they said, we, we want a cover story on White Lion. And I said, well, sure, we want you to go to Japan. We'll pay for you to go to Japan, and you'll go, and you'll, you'll stay with the band, and you'll hang out in their hotel. I go, cool. <laughs> like, right? <laughs> Right. So mm, that nah. trip, Mike Tramp is this six foot two, blonde haired god walking around the streets of Japan, Tokyo, with these little people, and he's sticking out like a sore thumb. So I don't spend all that much time with Mike. I interview him and stuff. Lon, when are we gonna talk? So <laughs> we talked, but the guy who and Vito brought a he he's you know he was Vito. He was a he was like Joe Perry, you know, quiet guitar player, right? Didn't talk very much to himself. And, yeah. and Lomenzo, I lo I liked Lomenzo. He's character, but the guy who like I don't know, it was like he's not Jewish, but he just felt Jewish to me. Like we had this sort of DNA connection. Was this fucker Greg? And on and off through the years, we never lost touch, and that's why. That's why you're here now, and that's I'm right. smiling, and you're here because that's I right. love you, man. And I that's where it too, started. Man. And we went to Rapungi. <laughs> Remember that <laughs> festival, the Shibuya Ku? I do, I do. Yeah, I remember walking up and down those streets, seeing those bands play, getting up and playing with them. You did, didn't oh, you? Yeah, 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 yeah. What a mind blow Tokyo that was is for so the first cool. time. Yeah, it's great. Everybody's <laughs> just like out there going for it. Where did you play? What venue? We, uh, uh, it was the sh well, I think the venue was the NHK. NHK, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Those fans, they sang. There's video of it out there. It's like I'm playing Eric Carr's drum set. We we'd flown in. I think it was. I think it, was, it took us like 14 hours to get there. Yep, yep. And then they put us in a room and we did interviews for three hours straight away. Yep. And then it went straight to the gig. We were so exhausted i think that was the least sleep we had ever had wow. as a band wow it was crazy but it was great rapungi prince and, the rapungi and there prince. was yeah. and there was this famous bar that the american models would hang out at called the lexington, lexington queen. queen thank you yes was that were you there when sebastian bach and billy joel were drinking no we were there when you too was there sitting oh. in the corner and we go hey guys hey guys you know Dude, well, yeah, it's it was a, awesome. It's sometimes it's, name yeah. dropping is fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm hanging out with Bono, and uh, <laughs> you know, and, you know, he said, and he said, and he said, so you grew yeah. up in Brooklyn, Queens, yeah. huh? Yeah. What was that like? Right, gotta go now. See ya. <laughs> you know what you might not know about Greg is he was he was in Anthrax. I was. No, I do know that. Oh. How do you know that, Joe? Because I know that. I know some things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I did listen to Prince all the way up here, okay, but that's okay. Greg, how, what was the early, early? How did was, was it just Scott? It was Scott and Danny Loker. Danny Loker, right? And uh, Neil Turbin. Turbin, right? And uh, a guitar player named Greg Walls. And yeah. you were the drummer. And I was the drummer. Yeah, Greg pulled me in, and Greg Walls pulled me in. He took me to Toys R Us to see Scott, where he was working. Scott yeah. was working at Toys R Us. He was working at Toys R Us. That's kind of awesome. That's so yeah. awesome. Yeah. See, we that's were, why he's such a freak for we like 16, Stephen 17 King years books old. and yeah. stuff. 16, 17 years old. You want to be in a band? Sure, I want to be in a band. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go be a band. Oh, God. 
Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, it was great. It's just innocence. Yeah. And wonder, like, what well, we, we could do this. Yeah. So you wrote, they wrote songs. You wrote, you helped wrote songs. Yeah, it was our first original band, you know? <laughs> first time, I think, hmm, pretty close to the first time in the studio, I think. You know? Very, very Was innocent. Johnny Z around yet? Well, um, Johnny Z was around, and... Uh, I think the way we we first ran into Johnny Z was he was he was promoting shows, and uh, he was doing them at this uh, place in Staten Island called the St. George Theater. So um, he had uh, Raven, Anvil, and huh. maybe Celtic Frost. Okay. Did you guys see that movie about Anvil? Oh, of course. Yeah, I did see that movie about Anvil. Great that documentary. Great, right? It was great. It Full was great. of heart. Yeah. 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 Well, one of the lips is in my Facebook page. He's been on there for like nine years. Lips from Anthem. I go, oh, wow. Lips. Cool. Canadians. Yeah. Yeah, wow. So how did that segue into White Lion? Was there other bands between Anthrax and White Lion? Uh, there were moments. Uh, nothing that uh, really took a heck of a lot of my attention. But, um, you know. Did you work at a Toys R Us? I did not. Where did you work? I worked uh, for my dad who owned an uh, uh, industrial hardware shop. And I used to fix jackhammers and stuff like that. <laughs> what a drummer thing to do. <laughs> totally, dude. <laughs> <laughs> heavy grease, man. Heavy grease. Heavy grease. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. How did you how did you meet the the band? How did Mike come from overseas? White Lion? Yeah. White Lion was a village voice. I answered an ad in the village voice. Like music connection out yeah, here. Like, yeah, right. Like music connection out here. Right. And yeah. Mike was from Denmark? Denmark? Denmark. Denmark. Yeah, he's from Copenhagen. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, I like your drumming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to throw the world. Yeah. Was yeah. he a James Bond villain? I don't know. My greatest Mike Tramp story is very personal. My daughter was born mm. March oh, 24th, yeah, 1990. Yeah. He was in L.A. and he, like the day after, he physically brought a bouquet of flowers to my wife to the hospital, Cedars. Mount Sinai Hospital in in uh, Los Angeles, and that was just a beautiful thing. I can't even remember the last time I saw him. I know that he's played his acoustic gigs. Yeah, and I wanted to, I wanted to like, because I know we would have such a great warm reunion. But it has been twenty over twenty years since I've seen him. He's face. doing great. I saw him a couple months ago, and uh, he's got a great attitude. He's out there singing the songs and doing his thing, and. Uh, you know, having a great time. He sounds really good, too. You should look at the stuff on YouTube. He's doing really well. He was such a nice guy. Yeah. You know, he didn't get he didn't get too damaged like front men tend to get. <laughs> or maybe he did, and you could share a couple of those moments. I, you know, I he think... He went off the rails a little bit. I don't think anybody gets out unscathed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, drummers do sometimes. Yeah, do they? Because they're so damaged <laughs> going in. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. You know my relationship with drummers. Come on. I know you. Ch I know. Charlie, uh, I've loved Charlie since 88. Since He was the one that I kind of spent the most time with on that UK trip, which was my first real trip to the UK. Well, maybe you were a drummer in a past life or something. Well, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's a possibility. Well, I, 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 you know the story about being dropped on my head when I was an infant, right? No. Yeah, my dad dropped me down the stairs. Mm -hmm. I, and what street do we live on? Will it be? Twilight Zone. <laughs> Next stop, will it be? Okay, we're gonna talk more, but I'm gonna I'm gonna play a song from my from my, and then this was a big hit, and then we're gonna come back and talk some more because this is Energized the Lion Friend Podcast, and we do whatever we want, right? right. Oh my God. <laughs> Energize the Line Friend Podcast, White Line, wait. Okay, so tell us about that record. Okay. Who produced that record? Michael Wagner produced yes. that record. The with great G -G -G Michael Garth. Wagner. With G -G -G Garth Richardson. Yeah, that's right, that's right. He was the engineer. Awesome. Or assistant engineer, or en second engineer, I don't remember. But yeah, great team. 
Garth went on to do the um, Rage Against the Machine, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, First he did. one. Yes, he did. Wow. Yeah. Was, well, was that, like, dazzling to be in a studio, or was it a lot of work and, and interpersonal challenges with the band members and shit? Was it real <sighs> structured, or was it free form? Because Mike Wagner made really sonic-sounding albums. It was albums. very structured. We were overly prepared when we did that record rehearsed oh my god yeah we rehearsed we had been playing those songs for three years you know um you gigged a lot around well we had a circuit that we used to hit between boston and dc Uh from uh narcissus up in boston to hammerjacks you know down baltimore in, in baltimore yeah and uh we would just go out and every you know whenever we could book it every six weeks do the run when we weren't doing the run, we were rehearsing five days a week, going over those songs. So, like I was saying off mic before, you know, I, I think we must have played that weight about at least a thousand times, you know, at least two dozen different arrangements. You know, we just went through it and through it and through it, and we got we got better. We got better as a band. When you got into the process mm-hmm. of making distributing, releasing, promoting a record. Mm-hmm. How, when did it turn to where you say, wait a minute, we're going to have a lot of money and this this is like <laughs> this is like like we we got a chance at like one in a thousand Seriously? <laughs> no, I mean seriously. It got played. That record it got played go and play, the, yeah. and most don't. No, we were very lucky. In fact, I remember uh one day one of the um one of the directors at Atlantic, because uh, that's another thing. We used to go up there a couple of times a week just to show our face, just to be in their face, to say, hey, we want to be the priority. We want to be what you're working, you know. Um, and uh, Were those the Danny Goldberg years? No, it was post-Danny Goldberg. Post-Danny Goldberg. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, we would socialize with uh, people at Atlantic. We became very friendly with them. And uh, I think we were out having drinks one night, and uh, one of them said to me, you don't know how lucky you are. And I go, why is that? And he says, well, you know, we picked which four acts we're going to work this year, and you're one of them. <laughs> was, I think it was Robert Plant, In Excess, Debbie Gibson, and us for that first record. Wow. So we got, we got the push. And wow. she was right. I had no idea how lucky we were at yeah. that very moment. You were naive to the whole political structure, to the crapshoot. 21 years old, 22 years old, no idea what was going on. Had no idea what was going on. Just, okay, is this this where the drums go? Okay, great. I'll be there. But (laughs) wasn't it great to be out on the road and have fans coming to the show knowing the songs? Yeah. That's well, we, special. We didn't know any better. We thought, hey, well, hey, we're going to go make a record, and everybody's going to love it, and we're going to be big rock stars, and it's going to be like that for the rest of our lives. It's going to be fantastic. Got a little piece of it. It was okay. Yeah. No complaints. So when did it kind of end? And then where did you go? We got to catch up. Yeah. Well, it ended in 91. Okay. And um, I went off to play with Zach Wilde with James Lomenzo. Uh, okay. and, we pl- and we really started playing with Zach. There was kind of an overlap. We started playing with Zach in 1989 and uh, had this band um, that traveled and played um, right up until... Um, but 91 was No More Tears, right? No More Tears, yeah. Yeah, cause, so yeah. he was gone with Ozzy. He was gone with Ozzy, yeah. yeah. So when he, was, when he was off, we would play. Sometimes we would travel out and we would play on his off days. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, wherever we could pick things up and we would be writing and demoing stuff and getting ready to do a record. And uh, we did that up until um, 1994 when I, you know, I just left and uh, they went on. Just had a parting of the ways. So let's encapsulate the last 20 years of your life, how you oh reinvented and done. You did other things. Uh, yeah. Can't rely on you yeah. know, rock and roll. For- um, when I left Zach's band, I opened a studio. Um, I had it for hmm, about 15 years. Uh, it grew to be quite large, and I got tired of it and yeah. wound up selling it. That's about as quick as I could say that. Mm-hmm. But it was great education. I um, got to sit next to some incredible engineers uh, and uh, learn stuff that, there's no way I would have ever gotten to learn if uh, I didn't kind of buy my way in. So you started <laughs> using your talents to 
like teach behind you got behind the scene well, instead of being I, up front playing. Yeah, and not so much drumming. teaching. I was just engineering and working as right. a studio owner and an independent engineer and uh, did hundreds of records. I mean, a lot of stuff, you know, hundreds of recordings, I should say. Um, and I really enjoyed it, you know, got into my head. Where did you live all this time? Studio City. <laughs> yeah, That's where Joe jo lived there, and I was born in Sherman Oaks. I yeah. mean, I was raised in Sherman yeah. Oaks. I'm in Sherman Oaks. You're in Sherman Oaks? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Jerry's Deli. Jerry's Deli. Sure. Sure, yeah. Lukather still lives on off of Vineland yeah. in the house he bought with the original Toto Man. I, I pass him when I go down to Starbucks yeah. every morning. <laughs> yeah. You know, Lon, I've bought this house twice after the first divorce right. and I had to buy it again. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's funny. He's the best. You're yeah. you're in my neighborhood of my youth. Yeah. I went to Henry's Tacos like a month ago. Hello. There it is. Totally thought of you. Totally. I did. I sent you a, pi a picture. Tahunga and Magnolia is that? Or is it Colfax? Tahunga and Moore Park. Tahunga and Moore well, Park. Well, the right? original Henry's was there for 50 years, right. and then it closed, and then they opened this little kiosk across the street right. next to the Italian place where right. Robert Blake killed the chick in the alley. Right, right, right. Right? Vitello's? Vitello's. Yeah, yeah. Good Vitello's. Joe, very good. I yeah. know things. Luke took me there with his kids one night a few years ago. He goes, we're going to Vitello's. It's great. It's great, man. It's great, man. It's going to be They blast, got some man. cool cats there. Come check it out. <laughs> You're going to dig it. It's really awesome. He's the best. He is the best. Yeah. Now, we're in Long Beach. Mm. San Pedro, Long mm -hmm. Beach area. and Yeah, I'm getting my Kaiser Soze vibe down here. It's, really it's for Kaiser yeah. Soze vibe because of all the industrial yeah. out there. Dude, yeah. Kai came over the bridge, and they're like building another ramp or something. Yeah. I hadn't been across the bridge coming from Long Beach to San Pedro in, in a few years. Yeah. I come from the other direction whenever I come here on the freeway. Whoa, it's 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 so cinematic this area it is you know it's incredible they filmed the scene when de niro and pacino met in uh heat heat they yeah. filmed that here yeah that's awesome so there's a band that kind of wendy and her brother sort of grew up around here in long beach saw them at fingerprints and they're nobody and they're called the rival sons mm. and they have gone global yeah. and we discussed them last night because you love them i think they're great yeah i really Enjoy. And my weird story about the Rival Sons is, is, is uh, I went to see um, Ray Lamontagne with My Morning Jacket as his backup band wow. at, at the Pearl at the Palms uh -huh. in Vegas uh -huh. about two months ago. And the, uh, Danny Zalesco, the promoter, and Billy Kahn, they arranged for me to sit next to a band that wants to see the show because this band that wants to see the show is playing the MGM Grand the next night, the right, arena. Right. And, 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 and I don't know who the band is. They don't tell me. So Billy Kahn sends me a text. He goes, so you know you're sitting next to the Rival Sons. I go, I don't even I, – I, I wouldn't spot them in the lineup. But – they're from Long Beach. Yeah. I guarantee you I could drop a name that they're all going to light up. So I, I sat next to these four guys, and they're, and I just turned to one of them. I go, Long Beach. And they look at me. I go, Jar Rittermall. And they all went, that's Wendy's brother. And they all went, you know Jar? You know him? I go, yeah. His sister's been a friend of mine for 30 years. <sighs> Fucking, we love him, man. And then one of them starts telling me, every time I got a new, uh, test out a new disc, I take it over to Jar's system and listen to it on his stereo. So, Wendy, just offer one thought about Rival Sons and how they came from your neighborhood and your brother. How, how long has he known them? I really have no idea, Lon. <laughs> okay, great. Uh -huh. Thanks for contributing. <laughs> <laughs> she could talk the polish off a golf ball. But here she has nothing to say. <laughs> Nobody is more long with Didn't she bend your ear last night, Greg? I was bit? having a great time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But she has that, I have no idea. Why. Thanks for letting me I hang. I really, with. actually, I really don't know when they knew each other. And I was turned on to Rival Sons before I knew my brother knew them really? personally. And I had seen uh. them. Danielle and I saw them on the Queen Mary. Okay. And oh, then cool. I was telling my brother, oh, yeah, man, Rival Sons, we're really digging. He goes, I know all those guys. That's it. See, that's what I needed, that insight. That's it. And we saw them at Fingerprints. Right. That's right, which is the record store here. That Fourth Street. Fourth Street record store that Foo Fighters played in and record Joe, our day. friend Joseph Arthur played in. Lou Reed did a, did, yes. did a, a poetry talking there. Wow. Yeah. That must have been cool. 
That was great. Yeah. So I've got here on my Apple Music, uh, you're going to pick the tune. Okay. I got the Hollow Bones record. I got uh-huh. Open My Eyes. I mean, Hollow Bones is 2016. What do you want to hear? You want to hear like Tied Up, Thundering Voices, Baby Boy, Pretty Face, Fade Out. We'll just pick one. I'm going to let you pick one. Okay. Thundering Voices. Here it is. You ready? Energize the Lawn Friend Podcast, Rival Sons. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> wow. See, that's what's so great about being spontaneous is let's just pick a song and just see how great this band is. We'll just pick a track, boom. And yeah. then the riff, it's all about the riff. It's another book that I've been it's writing. all about the riff. The quantum, Should I take notes? The quantum riff. Mm. You have to pee. Go pee. Oh, we start talking about his books and he tells me to leave. <laughs> he knows that he I've been discussing all of the un... Unrealized creative projects of my last twenty years. You have Talk a about your book. you had a studio. You were you were involved. Well, I'm involved too. You know, some sometimes just being me. That that's my job. Yeah. Just being lawn friend. Yeah. And it and if and if you don't earn a living for a few years, then it's and somehow you manage to pay the bills and people think of you fondly, like. When I see you or Fred Corey or the drummers that Charlie or the drummers that Brother I love. Brother Fred. Brother Fred, yeah. <laughs> Fred Corey's been down here. He I drove bet. all the way here. I bet he did. We had a good time. Yeah. That was fun. He took me to a hockey game recently. Yeah. Fred's big with the uh, Kings, man. Yeah. Introduced me to uh, to the media guy. Okay, here, so this is how things go with me. Okay, Media guy. Lon, this is the media guy. He goes, you're Lon Friend, and Fred goes, whatever Fred says, we listen to. And Fred goes, Lon should write about the 50th anniversary of the King, something cool about them. I said, I'll do it. I'll write about the rock and roll spirit of the Kings. He goes, perfect. So I send the guy, he gives me his email, send him a long email. Here's what I'd like to do. Luke Robitaille had a subscription to Rip Magazine. He's a huge Guns N' Roses fan. I'll interview him, a couple of the guy, the uh, people in the music business, Brian Slagle, Metal Blade Records, one of my oldest friends, a, a pure hockey fan, great guy. They've been responsible for so much success and bands over the last 30 years. I'll interview him and I long email a month. I'm still waiting for a response. <laughs> wow. And I'm All not right. and I'm not the guy that goes, Hey Fred, uh your dude, John or what he never even responded to my pitch. So Fred, I said I, What's he, up, Fred? <laughs> but, but I don't care. Hey Fred, if you're listening. <laughs> See, this is why I'm a detached guy. I put it out there and I don't I'm not the guy who like calls and texts eight times. If you don't respond the first time, then the universe has a reason for there right. not being a connection. Mm. And it's very possible because of emails to just get lost or they wind up in spam or in junk. But I don't know. How many times did you go visit the label? And then you became one of the four that they were working in yeah. here? Yeah. I ch- how hard did you have to work? Well, I don't know. What do they say? You do something 21 times in a row and it becomes a habit? Mm-hmm. See, I lost my something hustle, like Greg. That. Wow. I lo- I I started my career with hustler yeah. and I lost my hustle. Yeah. That's why you surround yourself with people that help you hustle. Well, I surround myself with good people. Good people that are bridges and the hustle would welcome you back. Yeah, but I don't Absolutely. have it in me. I don't have the hustle. Well, you never know. I mean, it just could be just like one turn. This is, this is your baby step. One this turn is in the fingers in the air, man. This is your baby step into the hustle. <laughs> this podcast, I'm happier here, yeah. and I make no money. I'm happier here doing this with Mike Stark in his beautiful studio here and inviting people that I care about just to have conversations. That's what you got to do, man. Sometimes the hustle comes to you. I mean, I was walking down to get my mail one day. And I uh, crossed Stephen Piercy, and he said, hey, what are you doing? Wait, you just met him happenstance? Well, we knew each other, but he goes, yeah, what are you doing? You want to play drums? And I said, yeah. Well, how long ago was that? Was six or seven years ago. And you've been playing drums with Piercy ever since. Ever since. Synchronicity. And you ever and since. him have a really good chemistry, 
and you kind of get past that whole Steven Rockstar thing because he he's, he's not like that with me. He's an abra- he he's, he's totally honest with me. He, he's, you, he's he's like got some abrasions from mm-hmm. from a long career. Hey, come on, Bon Jovi all? opened for Rat, so they had a pretty big yeah. they had a pretty big run. Steven's a real deal, man. I mean, you know. However you want to look at it, Steven is the real deal. Well, you guys played Vegas. I went to see you at Vamped, at Corey Coker's Vamped, and you killed it, man. Steven was great that night. Yeah, he's great. He was great. He How come great. he wears brass knuckles on stage? <laughs> he, they're not brass knuckles. They're mic knuckles. That's funny. Yeah, he <laughs> makes those. That's his invention. Really? Yeah, you could get them on his website. Mike, Mike Knuckles. Mike Knuckles. Wasn't he a great film producer, the, the director that made The Graduate? Mike Nichols. <laughs> oh, that's Nichols. <laughs> Now that's funny. <laughs> that's <laughs> now that's funny. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, because he has a, he's got a vibe up there, and yeah. he, you know he's been doing this for forty years, so he's got a vibe. Totally, and he looks fucking good, man. He's old as me. Yeah, he looks good. Well, he's rocking. Just did a new record. Well, you're hitting hard. You're hitting him hard. I love doing it. It's it's I'm. It's full circle. I'm back to doing it for the You're right reasons. You're a terrific reasons. drummer, Greg. Oh, thank you. You keep That's the very beat, kind. man. Keep the beat. It's very kind. What's a rock band without a great drummer? I don't know. A uh, rock band with a bad drummer? A shitty band. <laughs> a shitty band. A bluegrass band. <laughs> your, your spinal tap, your drummer keeps dying on you. Mm. Right? Anyway. Wow. Two hours. Greg, thank you for coming up. Hey. You're awesome, Anytime. dude. Wendy, thank you for the rival son's perspective. Well, and thank you for having me. <laughs> Joe, Joanna, for coming here all the way from Chicago. <laughs> Southside Beach. I wish I flew in straight from Chicago. No, I was in the same traffic Greg was. Can I tell you a quick <laughs> Billy Corgan story? Yes, please. I've got some myself. So I, I used to do the interviews for the Rock Walk Inductions at the Guitar Center. Oh, really? I was the archivist for like five years. Wow. Dave Weiderman paid me uh-huh. to come and do interviews. And Robert Knight would take the photos, and I would do video interviews. And there's an archive somewhere with some pretty cool stuff. And um, the uh, the induction... Wait a second. I just lost my train of thought. Who was I just talking about? The Billy Corgan. Video. So the induction for Billy Corgan and Jimmy Chamberlain for the Smash Punk, they, they, those two were there. And I never, I never asked any of these guys for autographs, but I, I was a fan of Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. That record, was oh yeah, hit, me was, too. Was was really hit me at a time where, I mean, it was a heavy record. And after the interview, I said uh, I had a po- They had printed up posters for the Guitar Center, Rock Walk, and there's, and I go, Billy, I really, I don't do this, but a lot, but, and he's and he signs. To lawn and he spells my name with two ends hmm. and i go no but how did you know that he goes i read rip magazine mm. i worked at a record store in chicago i had every issue mm-hmm. and i went really he goes yeah Lon. and i go thanks dude thank you and that right there is why you should be writing a third book <laughs> yeah so, Melancholy, is that one of your Desert Island records? Top five Desert Island records. What are your top five? And how many do you get? Top five, five Desert Island records? Yeah. That's really hard. When you, Wow. I don't know, dude. <sighs> Abbey Road. Mm. That was my first record. It was? Yeah. My first record was Meet the Beatles. Really? After the Ed Sullivan show, I was seven. Wow. <laughs> I walked across the street to the Fashion Square Mall. And my mom gave me money. Wow. Yeah. Chicken Soup for the Rubber Soul chapter of Planet Rock. I remember my dad bringing me down to yeah. uh, Greenwich Village to get Abbey Road. I was six years old. God. Pretty cool. Well, in the end, the love you take <laughs> is equal to the love you make. Mm. And there's a lot of love in yeah. this room. Indeed. Okay, that's a wrap. November 28th, 2016, Energize the Lawn Friend Podcast. So we're going to go out with some Zeppelin because that's the band that Greg. And talk about having a drummer as an idol. Me and every other drummer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and every fan. And we mentioned this track earlier in the evening, Temple of the Dog covered it. So we're, 
We're going to we're going to head out with some Achilles and thank you. I don't know who is ever listening. I'm blessed for you. Go out there, listen to music. The world will survive. Peace. 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 <laughs> and love. And love. Yeah. We need it. <laughs> we need it big time. Yeah.